great introduction. Thank you so much. Wow. Look at this crowd. Give yourself a round of applause. This is incredible. Look at what God is doing here. It, this is an amazing group of people, and it's all women. You know, sometimes, I, I, don't, I don't know if you ever get this, but sometimes when I'm feeling under attack and my faith is weak, and I just, I, I live in a part of the country where it, it is not a heavily Catholic population there, and sometimes I get these ideas in my head like, man, are, are, there, are there any Catholics left who are on fire for their faith? Sometimes I feel like I'm the only one who's trying to swim upstream here, especially as a woman. And next time I feel like that, I'm going to remember this group. So, wow. And someone said before I got on stage, oh, this is such an incredible group of women here and so many women. I mean, do you, do you get nervous when you do stuff like this? And I said, honey, I've got six kids, ages 11 down to two, and I homeschool. This is what I do to relax. <laughs> this, I mean, this is the only chance in my life that I can speak without being interrupted. In fact, if anyone out here, if you need your sippy cup refilled, just come up on stage and pull on my skirt and just keep asking until I do it. And then I will feel much more at home. <laughs> and by the way, I am on Twitter. One of the things I like to do when I talk is if you have questions, if there are things you would like to know, later I try to answer questions on Twitter. So you are welcome to live tweet. You can tag me with questions. I am at Jen with one N, full Weiler. And then the other thing is if you're bored and texting your friends, I won't know. I'll just think you're live tweeting. So you're welcome to do that. So what I'm going to share with you today is my conversion story, and it's, it's my conversion story in five parts, five steps that I took to get from lifelong, orthodox, passionate atheism to Catholicism. And I'm, by, by necessity, I'm going to have to skip some details, you might, unless you guys want a four-hour talk, which I'm guessing at some point you'll get hungry, you probably don't. So I'm going to skip some details. They are all in my book. If I happen to sell out of copies here, it's available on Amazon too. So if you're sitting there thinking, well, wait, well, how, how did you get from there to there? You can always find the answers in my book. So let's, let's start at the beginning. I was always an atheist. I don't remember believing in God as a child. I never questioned that there might be a God. To me, the atheist materialist view was simply obvious. When I would hear people talking about God, I would think, well, how do, you, how do you know you're not talking to yourself? I mean, even as a young child, you know, someone like, I remember being six or seven and a friend would say, oh, I was, you know, I was speaking Jesus, to Jesus the other day and, and he was really speaking some words into my heart and we had this conversation and I thought, oh yeah, I do that too. I have an imaginary friend and, and I kind of have the similar conversations with them. I really saw belief in Jesus as belief in a sort of fairy tale. Because to my mind, and I, I, it's like I have some sort of gene that, that makes me think like this. I come from a long line of engineers, and God bless our engineers, but my, my dad and my grandfather, all of these people are super logical and precise in the way they think, and they want evidence for everything. And, and so I just had naturally had this temperament where I would think, you know, I believe in this podium, I believe that it exists, because I can, I can touch it, you can weigh it, you can photograph it, you can measure it. Um, I mean, even if it did exist, how could you possibly verify it? From an early age, I, I, I really fell into this, what they call scientism, this idea that if you can't prove something by science, then it must not exist. So I, I, th I think I really inherited this from my dad. Again, he's an engineer, really logical thinker. And he was, he was raised a believer, and he lost his faith at a young age. He started asking a lot of tough questions. And so he was very much an atheist at the time. And he says he's agnostic now. So say a prayer. We're moving the right direction. And, and he was, uh, he, and still is, he is the wonderful, most kind man I've ever met. He takes my kids to all their activities and a lot of the activities are down at our church. So my agnostic father spends more time in front of the Blessed Sacrament than I do. So, and 
But he, he really liked this idea that he wanted to be free to be a good person just out of the kindness of his heart. Not because a book told him to do the right thing, not because out of fear of hellfire. He just wanted to love people and do the right thing out, out of the goodness of his heart and not out of a, a sense that, that he had to because a book told him to. So he sort of raised me with these ideals. And, and so he was very much an atheist and our house was not one of those houses where we just didn't talk about religion. We did. We talked about it. We talked about how it was dangerous and, and people could end up being controlled by institutions. And so I, I was very much an atheist and I, I embraced that and very much owned that label. But one thing my dad always said is he said, I am not raising you to be an atheist per se as much as I am raising you to seek truth and question assumptions. He said, always seek truth, even if it is inconvenient for you, even if you don't like the, in, the conclusions that you come to, you must always seek truth no matter what. And I tell my atheist friends, you better be careful raising your kids like that. They'll become Catholic. <laughs> A little warning there. Now, my mom, uh, my mom is not an atheist. She wasn't when I was growing up. She is what philosophers call a Maciist. And that is someone who is far more concerned with whether Macy's has an additional 30% off this weekend <laughs> than whether there's a compelling case for a monotheistic God. She, I think to her, religion was kind of, it, it was like impolite to talk about it. I didn't even know what her belief system was. That was, that was a very private thing. You don't talk about religion. So I, I really kind of got this atheistic idea from my dad. Although again, he did not indoctrinate me in atheism. He presented the facts as he saw them and encouraged me to come to my own conclusions. So that's what I did. I began asking questions. I began exploring. And it, all throughout high school, all throughout college, I only became more deep in my atheism. The more I asked questions, the more I thought, yep, this is the absolutely correct worldview. And it, I, I was, this was an age when I, I think Christianity was not prepared to handle atheistic arguments. So I would say something like, what, you know, why do you believe Jesus exists? And they would qu quote scripture at me. And I would say, but I don't believe that scripture is inspired. That's like quoting Harry Potter at me. Like this, this is not impacting me. So the, so the cr Christians were really not equipped to deal with the kind of questions that I had as an atheist. And so, so I remained atheist all throughout after I graduated from college. And so the first step of the five that I'm going to go through, the first step that, that sort of w started turning me away from atheism was when I met my husband. I worked at a high-tech company in Austin, and, and I met the most interesting guy. His name is Joe, and he's actually here in Columbus with me. And, and I, was, I was very intrigued by him. He had such an interesting story. Very, very smart guy. He grew up very poor. He was raised by a single mother. His mother came from a background so poor that they did not have running water in her house when she went to high school. It was a, a rough, rough upbringing. And she was a single mother. She didn't have much of an education. And so they were so poor that they often could not even run the heat in the winter. Now, this was Houston, so it wasn't that bad, but, <laughs> but, it was, but they were poor. And so she had heard on, on, the, on the movies and in some TV shows that there were these schools like Yale and Harvard. And her understanding was, you won't be poor if you go to those schools. And, and she didn't know anything else about the process or, or how one might do that. And so not knowing anything really about these schools, my husband just, you know, thought that that was good advice and he took her advice. And so he ended up going to Yale undergrad, graduating in three years with honors, Columbia Law School, Stanford Business School, and studied in the master's computer science program with a focus on artificial intelligence while he was at Stanford because why not? <laughs> and I've told him he is cut off from education. No more education. He's a CPA now too. And when he went and got his CPA, I was like, look, if you go get any more education, you better lie to me and tell me you're at a bar because we, we have enough student loans. No more. No more. We're done with this. He's kind of an education addict. So when I met him, and, and, and to give you an idea of his background, he was at, shortly after he graduated from Stanford Business School, he had an opportunity to work at this little startup. He would have been like number, employee number 12 if it, had work, if, if it had worked out. 
And this was a little startup you might have heard of called Google. <laughs> but, it, but if he had ended up taking that job, we would have never met because he would have stayed in Palo Alto and not moved to Austin. And I always tell him, honey, who needs a billion dollars when you have me? <laughs> And depending on the day, he kind of gets a look of despair in his eyes, <laughs> depending on how we're doing that day. So, so, that, so he was clearly a really, really smart guy, and that was part of what I thought was so interesting about him. So I was shocked when I found out that he believed in God. And not, it, not only did he believe in God, this didn't come up till we'd been dating a couple months, but he considered himself a Christian. Now, this is, this is Austin, where you can consider yourself a Christian and never go to church, never pray, never crack open a Bible. He didn't follow the traditional Christian moral code. And so I would ask, how do we get Christian from your lifestyle? And he said, look, I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't know the details. He said, honestly, I mean, I don't even know if, if I think that Jesus was definitely divine. I, I, I just don't, I don't know any of this stuff. But he said, I do know this. He said, when I was 13 years old, I was baptized in a full dunk Baptist ceremony. Now, they go all the way. I mean, they, they don't do it by half measures. So he's baptized in this full dunk Baptist ceremony. And he said, when I came up from the water, I encountered something. I encountered someone. And he said, I, I have more questions than I have answers. I don't know what it even means to be a Christian. Uh, honestly, I, I haven't even prayed in months. But, he said, I will never deny that I encountered something real in that moment. That I encountered someone real. And I thought, weird. <laughs> Crazy talk. <laughs> I just I, I didn't really know what to do with that, but luckily, it didn't really matter because both of us at that time we had we both effectively worshipped the same God, and that was career and having a certain lifestyle. We had this crazy lifestyle that like we we drove a Jaguar and and we both worked all the time because we thought that was the whole meaning of life, and we would like hear that Prague was nice. So we would go jump on a flight and go to Prague. And that was, the, that was this lifestyle that we wanted to live. And that is what we worshipped. That was our God at the time. And, and so and some people ask, that's really surprising that someone who believed in Jesus could, you know, be dating an atheist and that wouldn't cause problems. But that's why. His real God at that time was career and money and so was mine. So in that sense, we kind of shared the same religion. So Joe and I ended up getting married and, and I wanted to have, oh, I just wanted to rethink the wheel. I reinvent the wheel on weddings. So I was an atheist. I was not going to borrow from Judeo-Christian tradition when it came to my wedding. But then I realized that everything we know of as a wedding comes from Judeo-Christian tradition. And I remember the first time I went to Mass and everyone stands up and people in the processional walks down the aisle and then there are readings. I'm like... You know, that's funny. That's like what people do at weddings. I wonder if the church got the idea from that. Like, I, just, I had no, no connection there. So we reinvent the wheel. We, we write our own vows. And look, here's a little tip. If you are ever going to completely reinvent the wheel on a thousands of year old institution, just be sure to rehearse it first. We were so busy planning our after party. Couldn't call it a reception because that sounded too Christian. We were so busy planning our after party that would end up lasting 12 hours that we, we, just, we were like, ah, the ceremony, whatever. And also, we, we didn't even get married by the state at our own ceremony because I wanted to make a statement that the, the state can't tell me if I'm married. So we just went to the Justice of the Peace a couple days ahead of time. We didn't have any official marriage at our actual wedding. And then, by the way, to fast forward... When we became Catholic, we, we had a, a marriage validation in the church. And my Baptist mother-in-law said, how many times are y'all going to get married? <laughs> so so again, we've been married three times, so hopefully it'll, it'll stick. That, that'll work. Um, so, so we didn't rehearse it. And so I, I walked down the aisle in this dark purple dress. My West Texas relative with his big cowboy hat looks and says, Where's the bride? Because <laughs> my dress was almost black. It was so dark. Couldn't wear a white dress. That would be too Christian. So I get up there. We read our vows. And 
The ceremony was only seven minutes long. We had people fly in. Joe has friends all over the world who flew in for this. And I think they all thought it was a little weird that they came for a seven-minute ceremony. So just a little tip. Rehearse it if you were going to reinvent the wheel on an ancient institution. So we got married, and about a year later, our first child was born. You have to understand what an enormous shock this was for me to become a parent. I mean, it's like I needed to go watch some of those health class videos again to see like, where babies come from. I was, see, you have to understand, I am an only child and Joe is an only child. And I grew up in areas of the country where I, I can honestly say I never had a friend who had more than two siblings living in the home with them at the time, never. I never had a friend who had a baby in the house. When, I, when our son was born, I had held two babies in my whole life, and my husband had never held a baby. We were as isolated from the, the, that whole creation of new life thing as a person could possibly be. In the back of my mind, I, I think that I had started to think that new humans come into the world from a cloning room at the back of Starbucks, like complete with some wire-rimmed glasses and a latte in their hands, like, hey, welcome to the world, it's good to be here. And this baby thing blew my mind. It's, it, if you grew up in, in a culture where there are lots of babies and you, had, you knew big families, it's, I, I think you can't even imagine what a shock this was to me to, to hold this, it, it was like a little person and like it was mine or something and the midwife looked at me and expected me to do something. I mean, I was just in shock. And so I'm looking at this baby and a couple weeks in, I'm still just like, what is up that? How did this happen? <laughs> like, like really needing to, what, I guess, wow, that thing they said in seventh grade, I guess that really works. So I'm looking at this baby and, and I started to think, I started to remember a lot of those atheistic ideas I had. I hadn't really thought much about being an atheist lately because I was too busy. Like I said, the, the, the religion that I really believed in was career and running all over the world and travel. So I, the, the fact that I was an atheist had become kind of irrelevant in my life. But then with this child here, I started to, I started to think, I, I started to do what my dad always taught me to do. He said, I want you to explore, I want you to consider other belief systems, but, he said, always think through any new belief system that you encounter. Think through all the logical conclusions. Follow it to all of its natural conclusions. Don't be one of those people who assents to an idea, who says, oh yes, I, I believe this thing is true, but then only follows it halfway and doesn't really live out what they claim to believe. And so I, I started to do that with atheism. And I thought, what is this child, this baby that I'm holding, little precious two-week-old thing who was born with a full head of hair, what is this child in the atheistic worldview? And I looked at him and I thought, what a precious little randomly evolved set of chemical reactions that came from nothing and will return to nothing and is destined to extinction along with the entirety of the human race. <laughs> and I thought, that was the first moment that I said, this is false. This is not true. I didn't know what I believed anymore at that point, but suddenly looking at this child and considering the love that had come into my family since we'd been married and since this child had joined us, I suddenly realized that I, that, that love is real, that it is not just a product of the chemical reactions in our brain, that it comes from something external to humanity. And that even if the whole world blew up tomorrow, that this love I experienced with my family came from somewhere, somewhere eternal, and it, and it would still last, even if the entire world was demolished, that that love would still somehow exist and be present and would not just die with us when we pass on from this earth. And I, I didn't know what I believed, but I was more certain of anything than I'd ever been in my life that this love was real. And it came from something much bigger than us.
And that was the first moment that I was no longer an atheist. But I didn't know what to do from there. And I'd heard, I mean, I grew up in the Bible Belt, so I'd heard about this prayer thing. And so I thought, maybe I should say a prayer. This, that would be a good idea. But the thing is, I didn't know how to do it, and I'm, I'm an unbelievable nerd, so I was trying to be intellectually consistent, and I said, well, I don't know if I'm praying to one god or perhaps multiple gods. I mean, I, I, I want to be open-minded. You know, I, I live in Austin here, want to be open-minded. So I, I, so I started the prayer, and then my first question was, well, how do you go from talking to yourself to talking to whatever might be out there? I mean, I actually kind of made a joke, like, is this thing on, like with my prayer microphone? <laughs> I don't know. How do I know? Like, is there like an initiating sequence to start talking to the other side? I didn't know. So, so I just say, look, if any, anything or anyone, any things, plural, are out there, for the first time in my life, I am open to hearing from you. And then I said amen because I'd seen it on TV. <laughs> and so... I waited, and again, I have watched the Hallmark specials. I grew up in the Bible Belt, and I know what is supposed to happen next. I mean, maybe Chorus of Angels would be too much to ask for, but I mean, there should at least be like a really weird coincidence, right? Like someone knocks at the door and hands me a Bible. I was open, it didn't have to be like the full Chorus of Angels, but something should happen here, and nothing happened. The next day, nothing happened. Day after that, nothing happened. And so I thought, well, all right, so, uh, well, God doesn't exist. I took care of that one. can check that one off the list. I, I tried calling, and the phone went to voicemail, so to speak. <laughs> and months and months went on. And see, I didn't understand that when we say that it's so true what the Lord tells us, seek and you shall find. But I didn't, I didn't have a very good concept of this understanding of seeking. I kind of thought that, God was like a magician. You know, he, he pulls a rabbit out of his hat when you... thought of prayer, I, again, I'd watched too many of the Hall, Hallmark specials. So I thought prayer was like this kind of magic thing where you make stuff happen. Like you tell God what to do and he does it. And it's like having magic powers. And so needless to say, that set me up for some bad experiences. When I finally said this prayer and I just thought, well, I can check that off the list. Let's see, does God exist? That would be a no check. <laughs> I, I, I set myself up for this by not understanding what prayer really is. So I went, I went on and on, and, and, and I decided to dabble in Buddhism, because that's what everyone does these days. So I'm reading about, you know, books about Buddhism, and then it was like seven months later, seven months after I say this prayer, I was walking into a bookstore, and the weirdest thing happened. It, on the other side of the bookstore, and it was a big bookstore, probably from, from here to, to the wall over there, it was a pretty long way. There was a, a book, and, it, and I couldn't see it. It's like this big in my vision. But it was almost like there was a spotlight on it or something. The craziest thing. I, just, I had to walk all the way over there and see what that book was. And I get there, and I realized it was in the Christianity section of the bookstore. I seriously looked around like, to make sure that nobody I knew was in the store. And, and then I'd have to make up a lie if they saw me there, like... Yeah, I'm writing an atheist book, and I just need to do some research. That's why I'm here. And so I look at this book, and, and first of all, I, it was just so weird to be in this section of the bookstore. The only other time I had been in the Christianity section of a bookstore is back in the fourth grade when I took all the Bibles from the, from the Bible section of our school library, and I put them in the fiction section. <laughs> Which, and I thought that was the edgiest prank the whole fourth grade had seen that year. And so it had been a long time. That was the last time I was in the Christianity section of a library or a bookstore. So I pick up this book. It's called The Case for Christ by Lee Strobel. And I start flipping through it. And the, the first thing that struck me is that I believed that this guy actually used to be an atheist. That's what he said on the cover. He, it, it said on the back cover that he was a former atheist. And I rolled my eyes. I thought, yeah, right. I've heard people say that before. But I, I actually believed it with this guy. He seemed to speak my language. He could speak to me in a way that he, he knew what my questions were going to be. And, and it resonated with me. And, and it's worth noting, a lot of times when people hear me say that, 
They, they, they'll, they'll like, they're pulling out their phones like, one day shipping to my atheist son, case for Christ. <laughs> it's worth noting that I had said that prayer. I was in a state of openness. I could have found this same book a year before and I would have laughed at it and thrown it aside and it would have had no impact on me. But he, something about this book kind of grabbed me. I see now, of course, it was the work of grace. It was the work of the Holy Spirit. But, but, but this, something about this book made, just had a, it made a compelling case that I as an atheist could, could resonate with, could understand. To, to give you just one example of what, what sort of thing what sort of thing was in the book? Lee Strobel interviews a Protestant philosopher named J.P. Moreland. And J.P. Moreland points out, he says, when Jesus was crucified, his followers were discouraged and depressed. They no longer had confidence that Jesus had been sent by God because they believed that anyone crucified was accursed by God. So they dispersed. The Jesus movement was all but stopped in its tracks. Then, after a short period of time, we see them abandoning their occupations, regathering, and committing themselves to a very specific message that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of God who died on the cross, returned to life, and was seen alive by them. And J.P. Moreland goes on to say, and they were willing to spend the rest of their lives proclaiming this without any payoff from a human point of view. They often went without food, slept exposed to the elements, they were ridiculed, beaten, imprisoned. And finally, most of them were executed in torturous ways. And then after this, Christianity spreads like wildfire. If you've ever seen a, a graph or a chart that shows the spread, the enormous spread of Christianity throughout the ancient world, it spread like wildfire, despite the fact that back in those days, converting to Christianity often meant persecution or even death, not just for you, but for your family, for your children. And so what could explain this? What could possibly explain this? And, you know, I'd heard all the atheistic arguments like, well, there were socioeconomic forces and blah, blah, blah. But Lee Strobel said something in his book that, that I thought, you know, maybe I need to consider here. He said, you know, maybe, just maybe, Maybe they actually did see Jesus risen from the dead. And this was the third point in my conversion away from atheism. The second was when, the first was when I met Joe. The second was when I had that moment of realizing that love exists and is external to the human experience. It comes from something bigger than us. So this was the third moment. It's when I asked, what if? What if it's true? What if God really did become a man? What if he died for us for reasons that I didn't even fully understand yet, but was then risen from the dead and, and ushered in eternal life where we could be in unity with him? What if it is all true? It was one of the biggest moments of my life asking what if and a huge step away from, from the atheism that I had once known. So I knew what I needed to do. I needed to go back to that bookstore, and I needed to get a Bible. I had never owned one in my life. And I go to the Bible section, I, I thought there was just going to be one. <laughs> there are all these Bibles! How do you know which one to get? I was so confused. So I decided to get one that just looked least like a Bible. It was black, and it didn't even say anything on the front. It was just this little black book, and I thought, good, then if, if anyone sees me reading it, then I can, I can just put it away, and nobody will know what it is. And in fact, when I checked out, I, well, there were some people around me, and I, I just, I could not, the idea of me buying a Bible, I, my identity was so wrapped up in atheism. And, and this was, atheism was an important part of my identity, because one thing to know, if you know atheists, is that Atheism has been very well branded in our culture as being for the intelligentsia. Smart people are atheists. And I'd always kind of had some insecurities about that, just from some things that happened in college. And even though I was atheist out of conviction, there was a part of me that needed that reassurance. I felt like I could go to party, uh, and this is ridiculous, by the way, but in my misguided, nonsense way of thinking, I felt like I could go to a party and be like, I'm an atheist. 
And people would be like, she is so educated and smart. And I, I was, and you see that a lot in modern atheism. That was very much part of my identity. So gosh, if I'm seeing a, if I'm seeing buying a Bible, everyone's going to think I'm a superstitious idiot. So I, so I get my Bible and I go to the front and, and there were other people around. So I loudly asked for a gift receipt. I was like, I'll need a gift receipt for that because it's not for me. <laughs> it's for my friend. She's a Bible person. So, and I get it in the opaque bag and I like rush it to my car. And so, but I thought, no, this is going to be good because I I have a feeling. I have a feeling about this Jesus thing and this is going to be good. I can just kind of feel it. Something's going to happen here. And so I open my Bible and now you have to understand, I knew nothing about the Bible. Nothing. I never went to Bible study as a kid. The one time I did, I went, like sometimes I would spend the night at friends' houses And while my parents believed that religion was dangerous, they didn't think it was so dangerous that they should have to get up early on a Sunday morning if I had spent the night at someone's house who was going to church. So sometimes I did end up going to uh, Sunday school with some of my friends. And one time they they had a a contest where the teacher was having, she had cards with the names of the books of the Bible on it. And she said, let's put them all in order. And she said, why don't we let our visitor go first? And this was the Bible Belt. You cannot tell people you're an atheist. I, would have, I was a kid. I would have never admitted I was an atheist. And, and so, I, I, so I gave it a shot. So numbers would probably go first, because that sounds like a table of contents. Uh, revelation would probably be second, because you want to reveal what you're going to talk about. And then like, I put the names I recognize, like some Matthew, and I don't know what Corinthians is. I'm going to throw that out. Um, And so I I put it together in this crazy, like, Genesis at the end. And the teacher leans down and said, I'm sorry, honey, where did you say your family goes to church again? (laughs) I knew nothing about the Bible. I did not even fully understand the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So the Bible's a book, right? You start it on page one, right? (laughs) You start books on page one. Why wouldn't you? So I read it, and Jesus is the main character of this book, as far as I know. So the main character has got to come in by page 30, right? I mean, page 50 at the latest. And, and I knew that there were also something about fishermen. I would picked up that from, from Sunday school. So there would be some fishermen, and like he went around and he visited some people. So I'm reading. I get into Deuteronomy and numbers and some of this, and like the thousands were killed with their tribe. And I'm like, oh! Fisherman, this book is crazy. And I was driving Joe crazy because I, he, he would come home like stressed out from work or something. And I would say, oh, Joe, yeah, you're having that problem with your employees. I know you're stressed. Well, you should try sacrificing a bird over a clay pot and dipping some red yarn and hyssop in its blood. And he'd be like, what is this crazy talk? And I'd say, it's in the Bible. It's, I'm reading the Bible. So you're a Christian. You should do this. And he says, okay, he he grabs the book, New Testament. Let's skip, let's just, we'll get back to the Old Testament. Let's just go straight to the New Testament. So I thought, oh, okay, well, this is when it's all going to make sense. And so I'm ready. Oh, this is, I hear that there are more stories here. It's not just like the list of rules that I found in one of those books. So I'm ready, and it, it starts with a list of names, like half of which I couldn't pronounce. I'm like, what is this? And then I go to the end. And see, I'm expecting, because I mean, all of my friends were like, you know, you just, you read the Bible and then you become a Christian and you know what to do. And so I really expected some detailed instructions. I thought the last page, see, I really expected the last page would be like, if you find this compelling, then what you do next is you should go to this one church. And it ended with the story of some guy's dream. I was so confused. And the thing that confused me most is that even in the New Testament, I did not see a case for the traditional moral code that I knew that Christians believed. Like, for example, with euthanasia, abortion, contraception. I just, I didn't, I personally did not see the Bible speaking clearly on those issues. And so I went on the internet and I would search and I would see all of these people who said, oh yeah, like abortion and you know, same-sex marriage and euthanasia and, and all of this, it's, it's cool. I mean, God doesn't love this stuff, but sometimes you got to do what you got to do. And here are the scriptures that show that that's true. And then the person over here would say, 
oh, no, 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 that's, none of that is Christian, and we're called to a higher standard than that, and we're called to respect life more than that, so no, no. And here are the scriptures that show that that's true. But who's right? Because they both had scriptures to back up their claims. And, and then people would say, well, you've got to read the Old Testament and the New Testament, and then if you kind of interpret all the scriptures in concert with one another, then you'll see, it'll be very clear to you. And I wanted to say, do y'all not have jobs? Like, when do you, I, I had a baby and I, was, I had another one on the way at the time. I thought, when do you think that I have time for this in my life? To, to like become a, a PhD in scripture so that I can know the very basics about Christian morality. And, and also, like, that, that wouldn't even work throughout history. I mean, before the printing press, the average person could not own their own Bible in a concordance and all this stuff. There wasn't literacy very much back then. So I thought, this, nothing makes sense about this. And here was the biggest problem. As a non-believer, or a, 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 a sort of didn't know what I believer at this point, I was asking a very basic question. I was asking, who is Jesus Christ? Who is Jesus Christ? Because the Jesus Christ over here, who says that, you know, abortion's really fine, and euthanasia is fine, and same-sex marriage is fine, it's just really whatever y'all want to do, that is a different Jesus than the one who says that we must respect every human life from conception until natural death. That this is so important, in fact, that we must respect the act that creates human life even at great pain to ourselves. That is a different Jesus. I did not see a a group of people that were worshiping the same Jesus. And so I was completely confused. And meanwhile, like a good nerd, I had started a blog. Because that's what you do when you have questions about the most significant areas of life and you don't know how to answer them. So I had started this blog, and I had recruited people to answer questions on it. And I'd gone to some atheist forums. I had handpicked people who could just demolish atheistic arguments that I'd seen in the forums. And so I invited them to come to my blog. I would find out later every single one of them was Catholic. And I didn't intend to choose Catholics. I only selected on the people who could, who could just demolish atheism in these forums. They knew more about science than the atheists did. They knew more about the human experience than the atheists did. So I, little did I know, I had all of these Catholics reading my blog, but I didn't understand that. So I go on my blog and I say, look, none of this makes sense. I, I, just, I see everyone kind of worshiping their own version of Jesus. I can't make sense of, of the Christian moral code. And by the way, this, this matters because Christians believe, I knew from reading C.S. Lewis, Christians believe that, that God is good. He is the source of all that we call good. And so to say what good is, you're saying what God is. So to define a moral code, to say this over here is good and this is bad, you are saying that this over here is of God and this over here is not of God. These questions matter. And I said, you know, Anne, like this whole system requires the printing press and like I don't have time to read the whole Bible. Like nothing about your religion makes sense. So sorry, guys, I'm out. And I thought, man, who can argue with that? I thought all of these commenters commenters were going to say, Oh, you are so right. Where is the nearest Buddhist temple? I mean, the, I had just never thought of it that way. But they surprised me. They came back and they said, how about this, Jen? What if, before Jesus returned to heaven, what if he founded a church, one church, that he instilled with his own authority? What if, just like he did with the writers of the Bible, he took imperfect people and worked through them to convey perfect truth? What if he promised to be with his church until the end of the age? And what if it is still around today and you can encounter Jesus through that church? And I said, oh, yes, that explains everything. This is what I have been looking for. This is how people who are illiterate can encounter Christ. This is how we can know what is right and what is wrong and how to keep ourselves from rationalizing what we want to believe and saying that's true Christianity. Yes, this makes so much sense. Yes, yes, yes. And they said, that's the Catholic Church. And I said, oh, no, 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 no. 
what? <laughs> the Catholic Church? No, I can't become Catholic. Oh my gosh, it's anti-woman and all those rules. Like, give me a break. But, and Joe, oh, raised Baptist, he was like, all right, so it was bad enough that you're like on this blog messing around with the internet people. Now you're messing around with Catholic internet people. Like, I, he was about to like unplug my internet connection. But what I said to Joe was, I said, Joe, I have nowhere else to go. I have nowhere else to go. Because I'm telling you there's something to this Jesus guy. I have more questions than I have answers. But you're right. I believe that thing that happened in your baptism. Like, okay, I believe it now. I think there's something here. And this is the only theory that makes sense. So I began reading and researching. And all all the details are in my book of of my thoughts on abortion and contraception. I'd always been pro-choice. I didn't even know you could be pro-contraception. I thought everyone was pro-contraception. I I thought it was like air or water. Like, don't we all agree that people need this? And so, but when I started reading what the church teaches, the only way I can describe it is to say that it was like I had found the owner's manual to the human soul. Like, you know how if you've ever had some sort of piece of equipment that you buy and it's so complicated and it keeps breaking and it's driving you nuts and then you finally find the manual and you're like, oh, thank goodness, now I know how to work this stupid thing. That's how I felt about my life when I read the Catholic Catechism. It was like I had encountered the owner's manual to being human. And then, you know, there were all these reports in the media, the Catholic Church is so corrupt and there's, you know, all these sinful people in it. And I thought... Yeah, guys, but that only makes it more difficult to explain how this church has been around for 2,000 years, has never changed what it's taught, keeps saying this wisdom that holds people to a higher standard. It's, reading its wisdom is like reading the owner's manual to the human soul. It keeps speaking this wisdom de- despite the fact that it is usually the most hated institution on planet Earth at any given time, and it will not go away. <laughs> And so I said, if it's true that this is filled with a bunch of sinful people that makes mistakes, that only makes it harder to explain why it's still here. I saw the fingerprints of God on this institution because only God could make this happen and only God could keep this going. And at Easter Vigil 2007, Joe and I both became Catholic. And uh, where the story ends, right? And by the way, that was the fourth point in my conversion. So realizing that, realizing that the church is true and is guided by Christ and that, and that Catholicism was what I had been looking for. So that's point number four. And that should be where the story ends, right? If you've had a conversion or a reversion to the church, you know that you become Catholic and then everything's super easy, right? <laughs> you stop having problems and it's just like a cakewalk. I, I kind of thought that was what was going to happen. Somebody should have warned me. So, so meanwhile, so we, we were in the process of becoming Catholic, and we're, we're in RCIA. And I was, you know, with that whole, like, natural family planning, this idea, you know, babies are a blessing and artificial contraception is bad for women. I had really nerded out on these ideas. And I was on my blog, you know, lecturing people, like, oh, you don't understand how beautiful this is. This is amazing, guys. Throw away your pills. You've got to try this. And then God and the angels were up in heaven saying, ha, 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 ha. Watch what's going to happen next. (laughs) Plot twist. So in my second pregnancy, I was diagnosed with a deep vein thrombosis. It's a blood clot in a major vein. And and it's not what you want to have happen during pregnancy. It it can be fatal. And it turns out that I have a blood clotting disorder. It's pretty rare. And it it, it is exacerbated by pregnancy. It makes my blood very, very likely to clot when I am pregnant. And oddly, it's kind of rare to begin with, and I inherited this gene from both of my parents. And when I found out this news, my mom was actually in the room with me, and I kind of looked at her like, is there something you need to tell me? (laughs) Did you and dad meet at a family reunion? (laughs) It It is unheard of that people would have both copies of this gene. (laughs) My family tree might be a little more like a family poll or something, I don't know. But, so scientists cannot even study 
this my particular type of disorder because it's so rare because no one has two copies of this gene. All they know is that it's really dangerous for me to be pregnant. So that's that's nice. That that was good to know. Just as I'm mouthing off about like oh openness to life and and of, of course the church doesn't teach that it's wrong to avoid pregnancy, but it was just a very complicated situation for me to be in. And the thing that very quickly became relevant is that the medicine that I needed to take during pregnancy, both to deal with this clot and then if I ever had a future pregnancy, cost a thousand dollars a month. There was no alternative. And I did not have insurance that covered pregnancy, so it was very, very expensive for us. So, uh, so the baby was born, and we're, we're kind of ready to start our new lives as Catholic. And then, and then in a moment that shows that God's timing is often not what our own is, I got a positive pregnancy test. So right after I had just healed from this clot and gotten this horrible diagnosis, I find out that I'm pregnant. And honestly, it, it took me into this horrible spiritual low. And this was right as I am converting. This should be this joyous time. I was so depressed. I felt so lost. We had no insurance that covered pregnancy. We were living with my mom. We had had to do that because Joe was starting a business and we just we didn't have money, frankly. So we were living with my mom and, and I, was, I just thought, this, I didn't sign up for this. I thought being Catholic was like I'd have this really interesting moral code and less free time on Sundays. I, I didn't know that it was like, going to actually impact my life. And so, and so I, 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 I prayed to God like, I just, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing here. And I got one of those messages. I don't know if you've ever had this happen, but I was reading something and it was one of these things where I I just knew that God was speaking to me with these words right now. It doesn't happen often, but these words just really hit me. I came across this quote from Blessed Mary Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hesselblad, where she says, Dear Lord, I do not ask to see the path in darkness, in anguish, and in fear. I will hang on tightly to your hand. And I will close my eyes so that you know how much trust I place in you, spouse of my soul. So I felt like what God was telling me through that quote was to close my eyes. And I wasn't ready for that. I I commented to Joe at the time. I said, well, just because we believe God is real, I didn't know I had to act like God is real. I mean, I thought like I could still control everything and do things my way, but God took me to a point where I, ha- I had no control anymore. There was nothing I could do about this situation. For lack of any other better ideas, I prayed. I said, okay, God, fine. I'm closing my eyes, and I'm, but before I do, I'm just going to tell you what I need. I need a house and a cheap house, um, and I need furniture for the house because we used to live in a loft downtown. I have no furniture. Uh, and this medicine, it's, we can't afford it. Like, I've got nine months of a pregnancy, $1,000 a month. We can't afford this, especially if we got a house. Then we really couldn't afford it. And so then I go about my business. First thing that happens, on the way back from Mass one morning, traffic is redirected. Joe and I go buy a house that has a for sale by owner sign. We called. The guy had just put the sign out. He had had an amazing job opportunity come up in Dallas and just wanted to get out of there as fast as he can. He sold us that house so cheap that the mortgage mortgage company required a sworn affidavit saying that we did not have a previous relationship with the buyer because they didn't believe that that we got the house that cheap. Then my dad calls. He says, oh, I've got this incredible opportunity. I've got a job on the island of Grand Cayman, tough life. And he says, but they have a fully furnished apartment for me out there. And, And one of the things I had prayed to God is I had said, all right, if we need furniture, I need... I, uh, you know, while I'm praying, might as well go whole hog here. So I was like, I need a couch and I need a coffee table and a refrigerator and lawn furniture. <laughs> so my dad calls. And I, I, was, I didn't know. I'm like a new convert. I'm like, can't, can't you do that? So my dad calls. He said, I've, I've got this fully furnished apartment. Do you have any need for a couch and a coffee table? And I had told no one, not even Joe, about this prayer. And I said, yeah, I think I could use that. My mom calls and says, you know, I I know you guys are getting this house. My my white refrigerator does not match my black appliances. Would you guys take this refrigerator? I wanted to get a new one for a while. So would you take it? Then the previous owner of the house said he was moving into a condo area where lawn maintenance was taken care of. He said he was leaving us all of his lawn care equipment just as a gift to us. And then, oh, wait. Oh, wait for this. So then... You know, my insurance didn't cover pregnancy, 
and it was it was outrageously expensive. And so I go down to the pharmacy, and I didn't have the money. I could not afford this medicine, and we just barely, barely didn't qualify for like the government assistance stuff. But sometimes they would give me samples. They would take pity on me. So I had my little sad sack routine worked up. Oh, woe is me! I need my samples. And so, I, and so, but the woman wasn't really paying attention. And when I told her my name, she just rung me up, and she said, "That'll be a thirty-dollar copay." And I, and I and I thought about just taking it and running before they could catch me. <laughs> but then I thought, okay, I I want to be honest. You know, I'm trying to be a good Christian now. I want to be honest. And I said, you know, it's not. It's like nine hundred and eighty-eight dollars and sixty-two cents or something. Um, so just just ring it up. I mean, well, first of all, don't ring it up because I can't pay for it. But just give me some samples or something. And she said, "No, I'm looking at. It says thirty dollar copay." And so I said, "Okay." And I took the medicine, and I left. And I thought about everything that happened, and I actually asked. This is how dense I am. I was like, "Is that from God? <laughs> Were these answered prayers?" Like I was such a natural skeptic. I was still in this atheistic mode that I actually I was like, "Well, I'm just not sure. I'm not sure. Is this God? Is this God answering my prayers?" So then. Joe gets this great new job opportunity that has insurance that covers pregnancy, and they would, even though it was a pre-existing condition, they would cover it. And in this one, it covered my medicine. It was a fifty-dollar copay, and I'm, I'm telling you this not to bring you into the details of my pharmaceutical background. This becomes relevant. New insurance that would start in a month has the medicine covered for a fifty-dollar copay, and I thought, well, might as well save twenty bucks. So I'll just go back with this old insurance that suddenly is like a thirty-dollar copay. And I'll just get one more round and save the twenty bucks, even though it wasn't that important since we had the new um, the new insurance starting. So I go down to the pharmacy, and as I'm waiting in line, I'm just thinking about everything that happened, and I'm saying, "God, is, is this from you? Is this from you? I, how would I know?" And I go up, and I give them my name, and they ring it up, and they say, "Okay, that'll be nine hundred eighty-eight dollars and sixty-two cents." <laughs> And I said, "No, it's ah, that my insurance has changed or something. Look, it's a thirty-dollar copay." And he said, "No, it's not. I'm, I'm looking at it." And I said, "Look, it is. Look at my last transaction. Just look it up, and you'll see." And he types and he types, and he looks at me and he says, "Ma'am, we have no record of that transaction." Then I was pretty sure it was from God. <laughs> and God is good. So here's the thing: Why was it so hard for me to get to that place? Why was it so hard for me to trust? And this brings me to the fifth and final point of my conversion, because I did not understand mercy. I did not understand God's mercy, and here's why that's relevant. I'd been through first confession. I knew that my sins were forgiven. I could have gotten up and given a talk about the power of forgiveness and confession, but did I believe it? I still felt like God might love me at, a, at like a 90% level, and the thing is, oh, you wouldn't believe this. After my confession, craziest thing happened. I went back to sinning. Weird. I, I really thought I would like suddenly become a saint, and so there was this feeling in me like I can't trust God. And by the way, that that was the message that I got from all those answered prayers. It's not that you ask God for things and He's like an ATM machine and just gives you whatever you want. Although, if it is true, I do have my eye on the new iPhone. So, if that's how it works, just want to put that out there. No, the message that I was getting is God was saying, "You can trust me. I am not a concept. I'm not the idea that you read about in the pages of a book. I am a person. I am the living person of Jesus Christ, and I want you to treat me as your brother, as your friend. I want you to go to me as your father. That is what those answered prayers were about. But I didn't think I could do that. Because of my sins, let me tell you this amazing quote from Pope Francis. He said once that that he's never regretted anything with following God's call with his vocation. And here's this quote: I have it up on my wall. I look at it every day. He says he's never regretted it because always, even in the darkest moments, even in moments of sin, in moments of weakness, in moments of failure, I have seen Jesus, and I have trusted him. He has not left me alone. That's what I was missing, because you know what that is—that's God's mercy. 
That's God's mercy that he's talking about that, yes, you might have something in your past that you feel like, uh, I'm actually not sure if I'm fully forgiven for that one. That, that one was pretty bad. You might have something like that or something you've done recently or maybe you haven't been confession, to confession recently enough and you feel like, it, it, as I did then, oh, well, I, I can't turn to God now. I'm on my own because I'm in a state of sin. But what I didn't understand was his infinite mercy, was that he will not leave us alone and we can count on him and we must see him not as a concept but as a person. And honestly, the other four steps in my conversion, nothing mattered compared to that realization. As the, as the amazing founders of this conference said so perfectly, mercy changes everything. Round of applause for mercy. And that is the message that I want to leave you with. Mercy changes everything. And before I wrap up, just one final little postscript story. I know a lot of you in this audience probably know someone who has a background like mine, or they've come, they've done the reverse path. They were raised Catholic. Maybe they're an atheist now. Maybe it's a spouse who was raised Catholic and has embraced atheism. I want to leave you with a final story. So on the day that we baptized my children, we, we had to get them all baptized. It was, it was really epic to baptize toddlers. Epic. So I, I'm running around. I'm trying to find something to wear. And as I'm running around, I'm saying, Lord, how, how, how could this be? How could this be that you found me, that my path could have gone so wrong at any given moment? How could this be? I, it just, how did I get here? And with those words on my lips, with the words, how did I get here, on my lips, I opened a drawer and to the front slid a long, narrow box. And he guesses what it was. It was my baptism candle. This was rarely talked about in my family, but my mother's parents were Catholic. It was just a cultural thing. You have your babies baptized. I think they just kind of thought it was a symbol. We went into the church. But I was baptized Catholic as a baby. I never returned to church again with my parents. But I was baptized Catholic. And you know what? At that moment that I was baptized, I wouldn't even know it. I I wouldn't even think about it for decades of my life. But I was sealed with an indelible mark as belonging to Christ. That even an entire life as an unrepentant sinner and as an atheist could not wash away. And so that is the message I want to leave you with for for those loved ones that you want them to know God's mercy. You're inspired by this message. You want them to know that mercy changes everything. There's hope for everyone, but there is special hope for your fallen away loved ones who were baptized. Because like me, they have belonged to Christ all along. Thank you.